He was a legendary archer who gets caught by the enemy, but ends up marrying their leader and makes a harem. The story starts with Tiger, an excellent archer who belongs to the Kingdom of Brune, which is going to war against the White Kingdom. The night before the actual war, everyone in the Brunish camp seems to be excited for the war, claiming that it should be an easy affair as they outnumber the enemies 5 to 1, however the results couldn't be further than what they expected. The enemy forces were being commanded by a war maiden named Elen, who showed her genius military tactics and attacked them at night, when they were not expecting it. It ended up being a massacre, as Elen ended up killing anyone that came in her way, even defeating the prince of the Brunish kingdom, which made his forces lose their morale, and they started running away from the battlefield. Tiger still stayed on the battlefield by the time the morning sun came up in the sky. He walked around the area, trying to find any surviving soldier who he can help, but wherever he goes, he can only see dead bodies of men from his army, piled up on top of each other. Walking away from this horrifying sight, he suddenly notices a rider coming at him with a sword in his hand, but he takes care of him fairly easily, but simply taking aim and shooting him in the head, throwing him off the horse and killing him instantly. Sadly, however, the horse ended up running away, and Tiger wanted to use the horse to get away from the battlefield himself. While walking, he suddenly notices a small entourage of soldiers, walking through the battlefield alongside none other than the silver-haired war maiden, Elen. He decides that before more people die, he should end this battle right here, and now, by killing the enemy commander, which will basically mean that the war would be stalled for a long time. He counts his arrows and finds out that he only has four arrows, so first, he shoots two of the horses, guarding her from the front, giving him a way to shoot Elen. Elen, however, notices him from afar and jumps her horse towards him, unsheathing her sword and galloping towards him at full pace. He quickly shoots an arrow at her head, but she easily uses her sword to slice them into two. He gets taken aback by her precision and shoots another arrow at her, but the results are the same as she simply cuts the arrow into two before running near him. He realizes that running away is pointless, so she comes up to him and puts her sword on his neck, making him a war captive. He wakes up the next day in a pretty cozy-looking cell that looks better than an average New York City apartment that costs your entire month's salary. He is woken up by a female soldier with a sword in his mouth, which is kinky, but scary to be honest. Reminds me of my sociopathic ex-girlfriend. She takes him to Elen who is sitting behind a table, and tells him that she has taken him as a prisoner of war, as he is a lord of a small region named Alsace. She tells him that she will let him leave if his region can pay a hefty fine to her, but he turns it down, telling her that their region is not that wealthy and can never pay a hefty fine like that. The maiden however seems very relaxed and doesn't seem cruel at all, as she tells him that she has taken a liking to him because of his will to end the fight with minimal bloodshed by killing her. He knew that even if he killed Elen, he wouldn't have enough arrows to kill the rest of her guards, but still went for it, because he prioritized ending the war over his own life, which is very noble. She tells him, however, that many people at the court are spreading rumors about them and don't think that he is that skilled of an archer as they are making him out to be, so she takes him to archery ground as some soldiers hand him a bow. He tries to shoot at the targets, but the arrow flies away in a random direction. He realizes that the bow has been tampered with and is crooked, but still he doesn't tell this to anyone and simply shoots another shot, which again goes awry. The men around him laugh their asses off, making fun of him and his skills with a bow, but suddenly, he spots a hooded figure running on top of the building who suddenly produces a crossbow and tries to shoot Elen. Tiger tries to warn her, but it was too late as the man shoots at her with the crossbow bolt. Shockingly, however, she has a force field around her, which immediately activates and protects her from the bolt. This scares the man immediately and he starts running away while the guards try to chase him down. Tiger realizes that he might escape because of his head start, so he gauges the distance between them and aims the bow up in the sky, correcting the trash bow direction and ends up shooting the assailant in his feet precisely, and the intruder is caught. This show of surprising aptitude with a bow, especially a crooked one, gains him a lot of respect from everyone around him, including Elen herself, who praises him for his shot. For this reason, she gives him a mouth-watering offer to serve in her army and promises to treat him as a member of the kingdom. But Tiger turns down her offer because he has a county called Alsace, which he needs to protect. The next day, he is escorted by a Baldi, who was one of the guys who tampered with his bow to humiliate him, but now is one of his biggest fans because of his skills. 
he even shaved his own head to reprimand himself for trying to make a joke out of Tiger. He takes him to the dining hall where they eat a really nice looking meal, while Tiger tells him that back at home he has a maid who loves to cook. Later he goes to archery practice where a bunch of men try to make him their teacher so even they can get better at it. After the practice, he goes over to the barracks bathroom, where he sees actual soldiers who participated in war, and they are not very happy that an enemy who killed their brethren is getting so much respect in their kingdom. He decides to leave the bathroom as he doesn't want to deal with any trouble, and goes over to have a bath somewhere else, where he sees a small dragon cub, who is supposed to be a lens pet. He takes a bath, and returns back to his bed, trying to sleep, when he is woken up by Baldi, who tells him that they have captured an elderly man with a brunish accent. He quickly runs down and finds a cloaked figure sitting on the floor, surrounded by the guards. He walks towards him and realizes that this man is Bert, his attendant, who used to work for his father, before he died. They have a heartfelt reunion as he cries, and tells him that his region of Alsace is being attacked by an enemy lord, and they need him as soon as possible for the defense. He immediately gets up, and starts walking towards the main gate to leave, which is blocked by Elen, holding her sword. She asks him where he is going this late in the night, and he tells her to get out of his way, coming to a face-off. Tiger tells her to move the hell away from his way otherwise, he will be forced to disobey her orders even though she has been such an amazing captor to him. She still stands in his way and tells him that what he is going to do is incredibly stupid and dangerous. His foe has 3000 troops under their command, whereas he doesn't even have a hundred so how is he ever going to win against them? Tiger tells her that it doesn't matter to him right now, as he has to go to defend his region no matter what, as his people are in danger. Elen simply unsheathes her sword and points it at him, claiming that the act of desertion will mean that he will be executed as soon as he is caught by her. Tiger is very shocked at this statement as she can easily catch him if she wants to and even kill him whenever she wants, but she has kept him alive till now. He decides to calm down and plays it strategically. He bows down in front of her and requests her to lend him her troops so that he can return back to his region and defend his people against these attackers. Everyone is shocked at this demand, as he is supposed to be a captive, and he is demanding troops from the people who imprisoned him. The Len simply laughs out loud before looking at him, and tells him that she finds him extremely amusing, and agrees to lend him her troops, and is even willing to accompany him in battle, if he is willing to bring his region under her kingdom, and pledge allegiance to her. Without even a second thought, Tiger replies that if she is willing to rule over them with a just and a kind hand, he will gladly pledge allegiance to her. With that, she smiles at him and immediately calls her banners, collecting 1,000 men and getting them ready for war. They start riding tirelessly towards the region of Alsace, which is already being attacked by the enemies. Tiger's maid Tida, after discussing with several elder soldiers, decided that they should send all the men to hide in the forests, whereas they sent all the women and children into the temple, because there is a very low probability that it will be attacked as it would be an attack against the faith, turning everyone against the enemies. The enemy commander named Zion seems to be pissed by this act, as their soldiers easily enter the region and start looting the area. He seems to have expected some bloodshed, but is bored to find that everyone has run away from the area. This enrages him, and he decides to wreck Tiger's house, as he seems to have a personal agenda towards him. He goes into his house and starts trashing it, when he notices a young maid on the staircase, holding a black bow in her hand. He immediately starts chasing her, and wildly swinging his sword, barely missing her, before chasing her onto the balcony, pinning her down, and was about to hurt her, when suddenly Tiger arrives alongside Elen, and shoots an arrow in his hand, pushing him back. He screams in pain, looking at his bloody hand, as Tiger tells Tida, the maid, to jump off the balcony. Before he can reach however, one of the guards end up using their halberd to trip his horse, making him fall, but he still ends up catching her mid-air, while Elen uses her wind magic to save him from landing on the hard concrete, gently putting him down on the ground, alongside his horse. She tells him that she can control wind on her command, thanks to her legendary sword, which is only bestowed upon a war maiden of the area. He thanks her, when suddenly he notices an arrow flying towards Tida, but he is able to grab the arrow before it can hit her, and uses it on his bow to shoot back at the attacker, killing him immediately. He looks at his arm and seems to have gotten a minor wound, but Tida uses her already torn skirt to fashion a bandage and patches him up, while Elen tells her troops to get ready as they charge towards the enemy and finish them off. 
Before Tiger can leave however, he realizes that his bow has gotten a crack because of the fast movements and is basically unusable now, but Tida immediately gives him the black family bow that she is carrying. He holds the bow, remembering how his father told him only to start using it at very dangerous times, and he believes that the time has come to use it at its full capacity. All of the enemy forces leave the town immediately, and around 300 of the enemy forces are crushed inside of the town, but the rest escape alongside Zion, their commander. Tiger and the rest of them stand around a desk, considering their battle plans, while Tida is given the job to try and get as much rope as possible with the help of the villagers, as they are going to use it in their battle plan. On the other hand, Zion is furious with how the battle turned out, as he spots injured troops returning back to the city. He has bandaged his hand, but he still quivers with pain every time he touches anything, and decides to wait on the battlefield for Tiger and his forces to arrive, so that he can lay down a trap. He still has the number advantage by far, so he decides to split his forces into three halves. One to hide and flank the main force of Tiger, one to provide them support, and one main force to face the charge of the enemy soldiers. Tiger knows that his force is being outnumbered by three to one, so he crafts a similar plan by dividing his army into three factions as well. He takes the main army and stands in front of Zion's main forces and finally Elen takes out her sword before commanding her forces to charge at the enemy. The two armies charge at each other while the enemy archers rain arrows from above which would have caused massive damage to Tiger's army. But thankfully Elen was there to protect them with her wind magic, deflecting all of the arrows and protecting everyone. Tiger realizes that he needs to deal with the archers to give Elen a break, so he locates them and shoots three arrows at once, killing three of them in a single go. Elen is impressed by the way he penetrates his enemies and probably wants to become his enemy someday, but for now, while she goes in to fight against the spearmen, chopping through them like they are nothing and leading the charge deeper into the enemy territory. Tiger provides her with constant support while his loyal attendant, Bert, hands him new arrows whenever he runs out of them. They mow through the enemies like a knife through butter, and finally the two cavalrymen clash in the middle, creating chaos all around them, while Elen keeps slicing them up left and right. Suddenly, they hear a massive roar, which stops the flow of the battle, as Tiger and Elen realize that something is up, while the enemy soldiers disperse in both directions giving way to a giant land dragon, covered with plates of iron, walking through them. Everyone is shocked and scared of the dragon, but they still move forward for the glory of defeating a dragon, and end up getting killed in the most deadly way possible. The dragon moves through them with ease, flattening anyone who comes in its way, killing hordes of men without an issue. Tiger tries to shoot the dragon's eye, but even that is way too hard for his arrow to penetrate, while Zion laughs as he gets his troops on both of the flanks surrounding Tiger's army. Thankfully however, Tiger expected Zion to try something like this since he has a bigger army. So Tiger left half of his forces to break the flank, as they enter the fray, breaking the enemy lines and freeing the main army from being surrounded. After that, Elen decides to deal with the dragon and tells everyone to back off as she faces the dragon. She activates her magic power using a spell and creates a giant wind ball containing an everlasting wave of cold and stormy winds. The dragon starts moving towards her, but she concentrates the ball into a smaller area and blasts it towards the dragon, blowing it up in the air before slicing it in half and destroying it entirely. Their army lets out a sigh of relief as they can finally move forward, while Zion bites his nails, thinking of his next plan, while grieving for his lost dragon. Tiger plays a clever trick and calls back half of the army, as if running away from the enemy forces, prompting them to engage in a chase, thinking they can catch up and capture some men while they are running away. This however, turns out to be a big mistake, as the allies have laid down a long line of rope, which they pull up and trip all of the enemy forces, making them fall off of their horses, creating a lot of chaos. This makes them easy targets, and Tiger's forces cut them down, winning these small micro-battles, while moving steadily towards the victory. Finally, Tiger decides to play his last trump card, while shooting down enemies. While Zion is already tensed because of the losing battle, suddenly, his soldiers report that there are 2,000 more men coming from their rear, and they will get surrounded if they don't do anything. This shocks Zion, who believed that in total, Tiger and Elen combined had a force of a thousand men, and this new development doesn't make sense to him, but scares the Bajesis out of him. 
Unbeknownst to him, this is all a clever trick by Tiger, as it is a fake army containing less than 100 men, but has around 2,000 spare horses that were lying around. Zion's soldiers advise him to use the second dragon, but he strongly refuses after seeing how Alen sliced the first one like she was cutting tomatoes. Tired of watching anime on your phone or laptop screen? Well, I've just leveled up my anime watching experience from a small monitor to an epic 130-inch display with this incredible mini Flix projector. It's literally like having a personal theater packed with built-in apps like YouTube, Crunchyroll, Netflix. It's every anime lover's dream come true. So, what are you waiting for? Click the link below to learn more and use the code ANIME to get 20% off your first order. Back to the video. Combined with the hectic battle and poor visibility, Zion ends up believing in the bluff and gets super scared, deciding that they need to call back the troops so they can protect him, and they need to retreat from the battle as soon as possible. Their soldiers tell him to stay and fight as they can still win, but Zion is scared to death and wants to escape as soon as possible. Tiger's forces chase the enemy, and finally they are face to face with Zion and his main forces. He calls Tiger a traitor for becoming allies with Elen, who is an enemy he just fought against recently, but Tiger has no reaction to this, and tells Zion that he will pay for what he did to his region. Zion decides to play a game, and tells him that they should have a single duel against one another. He is at a disadvantage as he only knows how to use a bow and arrow, which are very ineffective in such a fight. Elen tells him not to agree, as they can simply eradicate his entire forces, but Tiger is your average no-brain egotistical alpha man, who has more ego than brains, so he moves forward on his horse with his bow in his hand. Zion hops on his horse, armed with a lance and a shield. He taunts Tiger, telling him that his bow is useless against him, while Tiger simply shoots towards him. Zion, however, is easily able to block his arrow with the help of his shield. This doesn't stop Tiger, who shoots the shield at the very same position again and again, when finally Zion charges at him and Tiger shoots one last arrow. The last arrow breaks the shield and injures Zion in the arm, making him scream in pain, while Tiger's forces cheer for his victory. Zion's forces immediately charge to protect their commander, while Elen charges with her army as the battle breaks out once again. Amidst the chaos, however, the dragon takes flight, carrying Zion on his back as he starts flying away, abandoning his soldiers to die and running away, laughing at Tiger. Tiger watches in disappointment as Zion escapes punishment after all he had done to the villagers, but at the dying minute, a voice instructs him to aim at the dragon, and he finds out that this voice is coming from his bow. Immediately, he obeys the command and aims at the dragon, while using his magical bow in combination with Elen's magic. The arrow hits the dragon and immediately kills Zion, then the dragon falls out of the sky and into a lake, dead. The death of their commander makes the enemies lose their morale and they immediately surrender. The day after the battle, Tita walks in on Elen waking Tiger with a sword in his mouth, becoming upset and jealous of the fact that her master was allowing other women to play their kinks. After learning that he will be visiting Alsace, Tita prepares lunch and dresses up to follow him, but he politely declines her offer, because he won't have time for a fancy picnic. However, she insists on coming along, and they set out. Meanwhile, Elen is summoned to Sicilia, the capital of ZCH Ted, to have an audience with the king and justify her participation in the battle against Thernardier without the king's permission. Regarding this, Lim asks Elen why she has so much confidence in Tiger. Elen tells her that aside from the fact that she's in love with Tiger, she's also fascinated by his powers and natural abilities. Lim understands her reasons, but still doesn't believe that's enough for her to trust a stranger she barely knows. When Elen gets to the palace, she explains that Count Tiger had hired her to fight them to protect Alsace's peace. This explanation enrages the king, and it takes another war maiden, Sophia Obertas, to calm him down. Sophie says that Elen's haste in action was because battles wait for no one, but that it is obvious that Brun would not want ZCH Ted to get involved in their internal conflict. When Hay asks about the punishment for Elen's actions, King ZCH Ted can explain what the kingdom's position is. Outside the royal court, Elen engages in a petty argument with another war maiden named Ludmilla Luri, a petite maiden who mocks her for being bashed by the king. Again, Sophia intervenes, bringing the two maidens to order. She later explains to Elen that Ludmilla's family are longtime allies of the Rardier and may later sway the king's opinion to side with them. She warns Elen to proceed with utmost caution knowing that her alliance with Tiger will attract her more enemies than she can count. 
Back at Brune's capital, Thernardier and Gainlon withdrew their forces, so Alsace has been peaceful. Although this is momentary, because their nadir is unhappy about the brutal defeat landed upon his son, Zion and plans to take vengeance upon Tiger and Elen. He asks his sorcerer prepare another set of dragons, which will take about a month in preparation for a full-out war against Tiger's army. For Tiger, the Duke plans to summon a band of notorious assassins to finish him off, while he plans to use another war maiden to defeat Elen. Arriving at Alsace, Tiger confirms that the locals are safe and lays down to rest. He dreams about his early childhood and moments he spent with his late father when he was alive, and wakes up shortly after. Finding Tita still soundly asleep, he wakes her up, but she becomes flustered and apologizes for sleeping off. Later, they set out to meet Earl Masha's, but surprisingly meet Lim there, so he explains his partnership with War Maiden Elen and discusses his plans to wage war against Duke Thernardier. Masha's asks if he will be taking sides with Duke Gainlon, but Tiger says he's not interested in working with either of the Dukes. With the backing of Masha's, who goes to Brune's capital, to make a case for Tiger in front of their king and defend his just cause, Tiger goes to all neighboring counties to gain the support of other noble families in his war against Thernardier. The nobles agree to lend him their support, assuring him that he's well on his way to becoming the third force in Brune. Later, Tiger, Elen, and Lim meet to discuss their next steps. Elen says she's gotten her king's permission to acquire Alsace, but only on the condition that it will be handed over to Zichet, thereby confiscating it. Elen also explains that the position of King Zich Ted is currently ambiguous and could take sides with anyone for the benefit of his own kingdom. She then explains that their major concerns are the war maidens who could turn against her at any minute, one of which is Ludmilla, who is a little Miss Goody Two Shoes. Speak about the devil and Ludmilla appears, interrupting their conversation as she wishes to talk to Tiger. She introduces herself to Tiger as the War Maiden of the Cleansing Sword and upon her request, the group moves the meeting to Village Roderick. On the way, they realize that they've walked into a trap and suddenly, they are attacked by Serash, the group of expert assassins hired by Duke Thernardier. The first assassin blows a dart towards Tiger, who escapes it and pins the assassin to a tree with his arrow. Lim takes the next one down but gets bitten by a venomous snake and falls early to the ground. Elen slashes the viper, and Tiger quickly sucks out the venom to delay its poisonous effects from setting in. As more assassins descend towards them, Mila uses her magical spear Lavias to kill all the assassins with her cryokinesis powers. Immediately, they rush Lim to Roderick for further medical attention. After Lin's recovery, the group tours Roderick's marketplace, and they come across some delicious-looking street food, but Mila refuses to have any of it despite being hungry to preserve her noble prestige. However, the lover boy convinces her to try some of it, and Elen becomes jealous, leading to another petty fight between her and Mila. Mila calls Tiger a great guy, but says he's too submissive to Ellen, which destroys his chances with other ladies. Their fight ends abruptly when Mila leaves for her homeland Olmutz. Elen predicts that she has returned to mobilize her troops toward Late Maritz to restrict Elen's movements and help their Nardier. Personally, Mila has nothing to gain from being at war with Tiger, but for the benefit of her principality Olmutz, she has to remain in the Duke's good books. Turns out Elen's right, so she organizes the others, and they plan their next move. Their options are down to two. They could fight Mila now and get her out of the way, or they could send troops to Alsace to prepare against invasions from their Nadir and Gainlon. Tiger highlights that they also have to protect their allies, so he suggests that they send an invoice to Mila. However, she ignores the envoy, and the both sides position their armies for war. As Mila organizes her troops and goes against the advice of some soldiers who question her for going to war against Elen. According to Mila, it is her duty to protect the bond that has lasted for generations, between the Thernardiers and her family. The battle takes place on the snow-covered plains of Vilaikalan, but ends with no clear victor and heavy casualties on both sides, forcing both parties to withdraw their armies. Tiger and the ladies sit down to discuss and re-strategize their moves after seeing how powerful Mila's army is, which supports the rumor is that she has the best defense among all war maidens. However, Elen claims that she can easily take Mila out because she once whooped her silly in a duel, explaining that they are always at odds at with each other because of some petty generational beef their great-grandmothers had over a young man. Later, they realize that Mila has withdrawn her troops behind the walls of the impregnable citadel of Tatra Fortress, forcing the Leitmeritz army to lay a siege. Unfortunately, only one path leads to the citadel, 
and it is littered with defensive positions, making an enemy approach exceedingly difficult. Mila used her cryokinetic powers to reinforce the gate's structural weaknesses with ice, making it tougher than normal. All attempts to penetrate the fort fail, and the battle quickly comes to a standstill. Seeing that there has been no progress and their soldiers could die in the cold, Alen makes a reckless decision to sneak an attack on Mila's army with no additional support, but neither Lim nor Tiger supports her dangerous idea, making her upset, so Tiger pacifies her by saying that she means the world to him and only comes second to his county Alsace. After convincing her to give up on her reckless plan, Tiger proposes a better and safer idea. The ladies provide him with a bear suit as a disguise, and he sets out to scout the area and find an alternate route of access to the fortress. On the third day, when he's out of food and exhausted, he shoots down a fox from a long distance and runs into Mila in the woods. Seeing the precision of his long-ranged shot, Mila is impressed by his skills, and with the bear hide still on, Tiger introduces himself as Urz. They have tea together by a fire, and she asks him to serve her in her army, but he turns her down, saying he has a home to return. Mila looks a little depressed and seems to be bothered about something so Tiger urges her to let it all out, so she trusts him and vents the burden of responsibilities and pressure that war maidens have to experience. She's particularly unhappy that she has to work with people she strongly dislikes for the good of her country, suppressing her feelings just to uphold her family's reputation. The next day, they part ways and Tiger tactically follows the footprints left behind by Mila to find an alternate path to Tarta Fortress through a rear gate. Tiger returns the next day with Alen and 100 troops to break through the rear gate. However, Mila has laid additional defenses there by the time they arrive, creating more difficulty for them to gain access into the fortress. Elen decides that they will not turn back now, because if they do, they would be playing their nadir's game and wasting time while he closes in on Alsace. Elen resolves to blow away the gate herself and runs with great speed towards the gate, summoning a whirling spiral of wind which attempts to destroy the gates but fails. This ends up alerting the archers positioned on the roof, and they begin to fire arrows at her. Tiger sweeps in and drags her out of the range of the arrows, then he borrows Arafar's powers like he did when he struck their nadir's son down. Equipped with a spinning magical force, Tiger aims at the gate and destroys it with a gushing wind, making a hole in its middle. This leaves the fortress wide open for attack by Lyadmeritz's troops. After infiltrating the fortress, Elen and Mila face off in a ferocious duel and begin a showdown of their magical powers. Elen charges towards Mila with her sword, but the attack is blocked. The ladies spar with each other for some time, then Mila summons sharp shards of ice, but Elen blows them away with a whirl of wind. Again, Mila creates a giant ice tower in Elen's direction, but she escapes it and lands on level ground. Both maidens charge towards each other and cause a massive collision of wind and ice, which creates a crater in the ice. Exhausted, they pause to catch their breaths, and Ellen's soldiers offer their assistance, but she tells them to stand back because the fight will soon be over. That instant, they are interrupted by a Sarash assassin who charges at both of them. Swiftly, Tiger fires an arrow into his head before he can attack, making it unclear whether his target was Mila or Ellen. After seeing their matching archery abilities, Mila realizes that Urz was Tiger in disguise. She thanks him, but wonders why he saved her life when he could have allowed the assassin to kill her before firing the arrow. He tells her that he saved her life to repay the kindness she showed him in the woods when she served him some tea to keep him warm. He was particular about her tea tasting heavenly, like something that was gotten from Starbucks. After asking him to make a request, Tiger tells Mila that he would be satisfied if she stays neutral. He would have loved an alliance with her, but he has nothing to offer her, and as such, she stands to gain nothing from their alliance. Mila agrees to hold a neutral stance in Brune's internal civil war, and announces her withdrawal from the war and from supporting their Nardier. This gives Tiger the chance to focus on the battle against the Duke. However, Mila's stance doesn't stop their Nadir from advancing with other plans, so he involves the royal knights in his mess, particularly one named Roland, the greatest knights in Brune. It's been a month since the Tatra battle, and Tiger returns to Brune with 5,000 ZCH Tedian knights and gains military support from other counties. Tiger marches his army toward Territoire, establishing his base in an area controlled by Duke Thernardier. The army coalition formed by the Alsace and Leitmeritz army is named Silver Meteor Storm Troops, which sounds really dumb to Lim who argues that such childish name will serve better in a nursery rhyme than on the battlefield. 
The meeting is interrupted by the Baldi, who reports that another fight broke out almost the soldiers. Ever since the alliance of Leitmeritz and Alsace's troops, many petty fights have broken out, owing to the large number of soldiers on ground. Tiger goes out to calm the situation, only to find that they were fighting over the shape of a cloud. Worried by the lack of response from the Brune capital and Earl Masha's, Tiger goes to Saunier, the region's center, in hopes of gaining new information, but all to no avail. Lord Augur tells him to make light of the situation and get himself laid in one of their numerous adult relaxation centers. Tiger goes to a quiet riverbank to rest his head, then he meets Sophia, who introduces herself as one of the Seven War Maidens. She was sent as an envoy to the King of Brune, to clarify Zichet's stance on Brune's internal civil war, after his prolonged silence concerning the war. She was sent by King of Zichet to deliver a message saying that the Kingdom of Zichet has nothing to do with the war, and that Alen was only acting as a hired mercenary. However, she wasn't allowed to deliver the message directly to the King, and the official reason given to her was that the King of Brune was very ill. She informs Tiger that he has been charged with treason and stripped of his titles and powers, and that Alsace was now the king's private property, and will be ruled by a new magistrate sent by the king directly. Sophie tells them that she met Masha's in the capital, and this relieves them, because they were initially worried about him. Later, Sophia assures Alen that there is currently no sword maiden interested in forming alliances against Tiger, so there wouldn't be a second Mila to deal with. However, the royal knights are the next big problem, now that Tiger has been branded a traitor. Lord Augur warns that Roland, also known as the Black Knight and Captain of the Order of Navarre, is headed towards their base to eliminate Tiger under the king's orders. Roland is an impressive warrior who has been fighting for a very young age. He was knighted at the age of 13, when the king also bestowed one of their national treasures upon him, which is his current weapon, the Durandal. Since he became a knight, Romans has never been defeated by anyone. Tiger holds a meeting with his allies and expresses his confusions by the king's decision to denounce him. While turning a blind eye to Galons and their Nardiers in subordination, Tiger and his allies send messengers to try and stop the attack. However, all messengers are turned away by Roland. Tiger has a meeting with the allies, and they resort to seeking help from Zetiched's army, after seeing that the capital had now turned against him. The Battle of Orange commences, and Roland single-handedly deals a devastating blow to the Silver Meteor Stormtroops. Elen tries to face him alone, but after a few seconds of sparing with him, she falls off her horse. Some of the members of her army rush towards Roland after seeing her struggling, but before she can stop them, he slices them in a few swings of his sword. However, Roland admits that for a very long, while he hasn't fought with any contender worthy of his sword like Elen. Seeing that he is way too powerful for her basic sword swings, she is forced to use her sword's full powers on him, but before she can do that, Tiger fires an arrow into the air, and Roland thinks this is a foolish misfired shot, but to his greatest surprise, the arrow lands on his horse and kills it instantly. Tiger narrowly escapes Roland's sword with Elen by his side. However, in the process of rescuing Elen, Tiger gets gravely injured, with a deep wound from a slash on his chest. Unfortunately for them, Roland's army is fast approaching and almost closing in on them, but they are saved when Sophie miraculously appears and tells them to go, leaving her to take care of the situation. Sophie summons a strong light, Falvarna, which creates a powerful, impenetrable barricade. However, some dumb soldiers attempt to ride into it, and are absorbed into the wall, together with their horses. When Roland gets there, he inquires to know if the Wall of Light was magically created, saying that even if it is, nothing will get in his way. After a while, the magic begins to wear off, so Roland shatters the barrier in one strike. They engage in a fierce combat for a bit, but after a while, she turns her magical staff and disappears after a chant, being satisfied with the lead that the two have from the Navar Knights. This initially puzzles Roland, but he later figures that Sophie was only engaging him to buy time for Elen and Tiger. Soon enough, one of the soldiers brings a report that they were ambushed at the rear by a reinforcements group with Masha's in the lead. Knowing better, Roland commands them to fall back and abandon their pursuit. In a moment of self-reflection, Roland recalls the meeting he had with the dukes. Galon said the king was too ill to be visited by anyone, including a royal knight of Roland's repute. However, the duke said he should get rid of Tiger and his army, because the king ordered this, after marking Tiger as a traitor. Now, Roland realizes that the interaction was a little sketchy, and the men are not as trustworthy as they paint themselves to be, 
so he decides to finish his business with Tiger and have a direct meeting with the king at all costs. Back at camp, Tiger's condition keeps worsening by the minute as his injury was really deep. After they ask to know what happened at the capital, Mashas tells them that even he couldn't directly meet the king because of his illness, and after finding a way to sneak in, the palace was practically under the control of the lords Galon and their Nardier. The prime minister, Baduin, approached him privately and let him see the king's condition for himself. It seems the death of his son, the Prince of Brun, in the Battle of Denante has driven him crazy with grief, to the point of playing with building blocks like a child. Taking advantage of this situation, Galon and their Nardier are working behind the scenes to make it appear as if it is the Imperial Order's wish to crush Tiger, and that they were the ones to manipulate and put Roland up to the task of attacking Tiger. Sure enough, Masha's was attacked by a bunch of assassins sent by either of the dukes soon after meeting with Baduin, and Sophia just happened to be passing by at the time, so she helped him to defeat the assassins. Now that Tiger is too wounded to lead the army, Alen takes up the responsibility. She excuses Tida and kneels beside Tiger, assuring him that she will lead the army in his stead. Elen later meets up with Sophie who tells her that she will also assist in the battle, despite being just an envoy. On the other hand, Roland discusses with another royal knight and find out that their nadir is the perpetrator of the war because he attacked Alsace for no known reason. However, Roland isn't going to stop the war because of the presence of Zichechen armies in the kingdom. With the injured and sick left behind at the camp, the Silver Meteor Stormtroop makes its way to battle. They divert the river's course to flow through the plain with the help of sandbags. This turns it into a swamp that will impede the enemy's squads. Before morning breaks, they take up positions facing south. Opposite them, Ronald's army assumes a crescent formation. The first squad will attack the Silver Meteor's advance guard, the second group will attack from the flank, and the third will spread wide to attack if the enemy attacks the first or second groups. Soon, the battle begins. Elen draws Ronald away from the main forces, and she and Sophie use their wind and light powers together to try and defeat him, and it initially seems to be working, but he cuts right through the magical ball of air with the help of his almighty sword Durindal, much to the surprise of the maidens. Confidently, Roland approaches them with a resolve to put an end to the battle as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, back at the army camp, Tiger regains his consciousness to find his bow glowing. With Tida by his side, the black bow guides him to a temple in the middle of nowhere, which is dedicated to Turna Fall, the goddess of night, darkness and death. Tiger demands to know why she brought him there, then she suddenly possesses Tida. She says that she didn't call him, but exposes that he came on his own because he was searching for power. She promises to grant him powers if he shoots Tida. Consider it a test of his resolve. He controls his powers and applies it to the arrow so that it disperses before it hits her, causing her to remain unharmed. Satisfied with his performance, Turnafal grants him the powers and Tiger rushes to the battlefield. He arrives in time to help Elen and Sophie, shooting Roland's armor at a long range before he gets to the ladies. They explain that Tiger only hired them to defeat Lord Thernadier, and after accomplishing that and getting paid, they'll be returning to Zichet. They ask him to join their just cause against their Nadir, but he rejects their offer, saying that he is a royal knight and only takes direct orders from the king. At some point, Tiger almost succumbs to his injuries, but he strengthens his resolve and aims at Roland with his newfound powers, while Roland attempts to strike it down with Durandal. In a fierce struggle Roland blocks the power with his sword, and after a while, a massive explosion occurs that creates a cavity in the ground. Surprisingly, Roland manages to remain on his feet, but he suddenly drops to his knees and surrenders because he has lost control of his arms due to the effect of Roland's power. Tiger also falls unconscious soon after. Following Roland's surrender, the Order of Nevar withdraws from the battle, but not before they lose over half their soldiers in the battle. Now, Tiger's army can march straight to the nadir to settle their scores. The next morning, some knights tidy up the remains of fallen soldiers and prepare a burial ground for them. After learning the corrupt ways of Galon and their nadir, Roland offers to go to the capital to get Tiger a direct audience with the king as amends for attacking him, but they warn him of the danger he could be walking into, given that Masha's barely made it out alive. He stubbornly refuses, saying that he owes it to them, as an apology for wrongly attacking them. He visits the burial ground of the fallen soldiers, then proceeds to the capital. He also leaves Durandal in the hands of Tiger as proof of his support for his cause, and visits the burial ground of fallen Burnian soldiers. 
However, upon reaching the Imperial Palace, Roland is trapped in a room by Duke Ganelion, who mocks him for having the guts to show his face at the capital, even after losing to Tiger. Ganelion then ruthlessly kills him by letting a swarm of lethal bees loose, creating an insectile hell. Roland dies standing up straight, reflecting his valiance even in his last moments. Meanwhile, Elen receives an urgent call and must go to Legnica to assist a war maiden Alexandra Sasha Alshivin, who governs Regnitz. Sasha is bedridden due to a terrible illness, but is currently under attack by another war maiden. Elen says she is indebted to her by an oath and must uphold their promise of helping each other in times of dire need, no matter the circumstances. Recently, when Elen visited Sasha, she looked like a living corpse and could barely walk on her own. Despite her condition, Sasha's dragon gear still recognizes her as its owner, so she's forced to remain a war maiden and maintain her duties in spite of her condition. For this reason, Elen has to help Sasha and if possible, fight on her behalf. At the same time, Sophie returns to her kingdom and Tiger thanks her for her support and is later joined by Rurik who kneels and pledges his loyalty and support to him. Unfortunately, Tiger gets the shocking news of Roland's execution, and in the capital tensions rise between their Nardier and Ganelion as Roland's execution was carried out without consulting with their Nardier. He is concerned that they might be exposed to threats from their western neighbors who will take advantage of the fact that there is no knight to protect their western border again. Ganelion seems unrepentant and maliciously informs their Nardier that the Muezinalan army is approaching by land and sea to attack his people from the southern border and probably use his people as slaves. Muezinal is a powerful neighboring country and one of the few in that region that still practices slave trade, so they randomly invade other countries, slaughtering and plundering everything, for absolutely no reason. Already, about 20,000 Muezinalian soldiers are attacking Brune and taking its people into captivity, so Thernardier divides his army into two contingents. The first consisting of 7,000 soldiers marching toward the southern border to defend against the approaching Muezinalians. He plans to lure the enemies deeper into the country, leaving the borderlands undefended. Thernardier's second army of 13,000 men remain in the capital under the pretext of protecting it, but are in reality, keeping an eye on Gamelon, who is building up his army in the northern border. After learning of the invaders, Tiger stays overnight, studying the pathways and trying to formulate the best strategies. Tita comes to serve him his meal, and tells him not to get too worked up. He tells her to stay behind with Bertrand, and she agrees to, on the condition that he returns safe and sound to them. Later, the Baldi asks Tiger what their chances of winning are, but doesn't get the expected heroic response, as Tiger sincerely tells him that they're outnumbered 20 men to 1. He later consults with Masha's and the others and asks them for a favor. Later, he goes scouting with Rurik and some other volunteers, and after seeing how the maltreatment being dished to the captives, he decides that their plan would be to save as many captives as they can. Tiger looks at his black bow and has an internal conflict on whether to use it or not given that he is yet to fully master its power. As they set forth, Tiger rescues one of the fleeing captives from being caught by some Muezalian fighters. Seeing that she's terrified, Tiger reassures her that she's safe with him, because he's also a Brunian. Afterwards, he consults with a royal knight, Gerald, who offers his mathematical wisdom in creating a plan to rescue the people of Brun, and estimates that they don't have enough supplies or manpower. At this point, the Muosnilians have taken the Brennians captive and could use them as human shields if Tiger's army launches an attack, so Tiger makes up for their lack in manpower and supplies with a brilliant strategy. 200 of his cavalrymen attack one of the enemy's flanks, causing the Muosnilian general Kasim to send 3,000 soldiers made of bowmen and spearmen to eradicate the 200 cavalrymen and the main army of what he deduces to be around 2,000 soldiers. The decoy of 200 soldiers leads the Muazilian troops to a narrow choke point with a dead end, where the main army waits for them. Shocked to see an army of over 5,000 men, the Muazilian soldiers at the front call for a retreat, but it is already too late, and the 3,000 enemy soldiers are defeated in no time. Their leftover ammunition is collected to be used by the Silver Meteor stormtroops. Next, Tiger sets up many skirmishes to repeatedly attack the main enemy force and whittle away their numbers. After repeated sneak attacks, the Muasilian army was reduced from 20,000 to 18,000 soldiers. Frustrated by all the sneaky attacks, General Qasim executes a handful of Brunaman civilians as retaliation. He then organizes a troop of 3,000 meant to go before the main army, assuming that Tiger's army will never attack head-on in an outnumbered situation. 
In an unexpected move, Tiger faces the main army head-on with only 600 soldiers. Kasim mocks the Bruins for choosing a mere archer to be their captain, despite the fact that the Brunians do not respect archers. Tiger tells them that they deserve to die for killing civilian soldiers, so Kasim sends his soldiers to shoot Tiger when he gets closer, but they are surprised by battle cries from the cliff above them and realize that he has come with a massive ZCHTDN unit. Again, Kasim foolishly underestimates Tiger's abilities, and while the ZCHTDNs charge at the Muanzalians, Tiger aims at General Kasim. Despite two armies fighting each other in between them, Tiger's arrow hits Kasim squarely in the head. The general's death forces the Muazalian military to retreat, but Tiger commands his army to chase after them. After the battle, Tiger frees Tutankhamun captured as slaves by the invaders. But they are still mourning the loss of their murdered counterparts and blame him for taking so long before coming to the rescue. However, a little girl comes to thank him for avenging her father's death and on the same day freeing her from captivity. Despite the miraculously low casualties suffered by the Silver Meteor stormtroops, they are very low in supplies and need time to recover. At the end of the day, the Muazalian army loses over a quarter of their men however, they find out from the prisoners that there are roughly 40,000 men approaching them in a few days, and some have started to arrive in batches. Tiger sets out with a small cavalry unit to face the first group of invaders. He tries to use the wind to his advantage by shooting arrows at them. But this does not stop the army from proceeding towards Tiger and his army. Things seem to be taking a bitter turn when he spots an army on the heels that he believes to be reinforcements for the enemies. He is, however, shocked to find that it is Mila arriving with more Zichechen soldiers. In her healthy state, Sasha was like a big sister to Elen and Mila and usually separated their pointless fights, teaching them to use their powers only when necessary. However, over the years, her health condition has taken a nosedive and as Elen and Lim arrive at Legnica to meet her, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. She's grown tired of holding the War Maiden title, but is forced to keep it as long as her dragon twin swords are bound to her. She tells Elen that the War Maiden Elisabetta Lisa Fomina is invading her as an act of vengeance. A few months ago, Sasha and Lisa were working together to take down a group of pirates. When they'd almost won, Lisa sent out a complaint accusing Sasha's soldiers of deliberately leading the pirates to her army despite no clear evidence to support the claim in any of the reports. Now, Lisa is invading Legnica as payback, so Elen gladly offers her support in protecting Legnica. On a lighter note, Elen tells Sasha about Tiger and his achievements, saying that she might find him to be a really likable young man and hopes for Sasha to meet him someday. Meanwhile, the commander of the Muazalian army is informed about a coalition between the Zichechen army and Tiger's army because of a sword maiden's interest in Tiger. He then decides that if the sword maiden is really as beautiful as the rumors have it, he will join forces with her to help Tiger defeat their nadir, but if she has Frankenstein's face, he wouldn't hesitate to chop her head off. Over at Silver Meteor Stormtroops base camp, Tiger sits down with Mila to negotiate an alliance, but Tiger sounds too desperate for help, so Mila turns this into a counseling session and teaches him how to negotiate like a true warrior and stop looking weak. She agrees to lend her 4,000 troops in exchange for an equal favor from him later. They discuss possible battle strategies to face the invading army led by Commander Balamir, also known as Barabaros, a fierce and seasoned warrior who is famous for taking down a fleet of thousand ships that were attacking Muzinil with only 200 ships of his own. The exhausted stormtroops can only afford one more battle, so they plan to settle everything within the single battle. Mila suggests Tiger use Arafar, the same bow he used to break down Tatra Fortress, heavily reinforced rear gate. But Tiger points out that he doesn't yet fully understand its powers and sometimes loses consciousness after using it. Considering Tiger being awake and essential for the battle, they decide not to rely on the bow and use it only as a last resort. Mila highlights that normally because he is fighting a war against a larger army, he can either focus on taking out their commander or disrupting their supply lines. However, the second option was not a viable option because Tiger's army will be overpowered before they can take out Moisinal's supply lines. Again, considering that Barbaros isn't a weak commander, taking him out will be a difficult task to accomplish. Both options being considered, the battle against Murzinal was not going to be a walk in the park, but after much thinking, Mila shares a high-risk battle strategy that might just work against the huge Barbaros army. After that, one of Tiger's men informs him that one of the rescues refuses to eat. He goes to offer her food himself, but she insists on having his own soup. 
She introduces herself as Regin, and before Tiger leaves, she asks for one little favor. Meanwhile, Elen marches down to the northeast of Legnica with the united troops of Legnica and Leitmeritz, numbering about 3,000 to face the waiting war maiden Lisa. Lisa is another beautiful war maiden with a condition called heterochromia iridum, which causes her to have different colors on each iris. However, before they leave, Sasha calls Lim aside and entrusts her to watch over Elen, because her recent actions have attracted her a lot of enemies and friend who could turn against her. Sasha says that Elen will not be protected from such people by her dragon gear alone, but by loyal friends such as Lim. While their armies charge at each other, Lim attempts to follow Elen in a bid to protect her, but she orders her to stay behind and command the army, because only war maidens can defeat each other. So Elen drops off her horse as she and Lisa go to the outskirts of the battle to face each other. They go all out in a fight with their demon gear, Elen with her wind sword, and Lisa with a crackling whip that shoots lightning. Elen summons a powerful whirl of wind towards Lisa, but she counters it with an overwhelming amount of electricity and begins to mock Elen, who is momentarily thrown to the ground. But soon enough, Elen gets back on her feet, and after an explosive clash of both powers, with her whirling wind overwhelming Lisa, she gains advantage by pushing Lisa backwards, and Lisa surrenders. Elen doesn't want to back off until she has Lisa's head, but Lisa points out that she's wasting so much precious time when the war against Tiger is brewing fast. Gaumon and their nadir are no longer busy with each other's armies, so Gaumon has probably mobilized his own army in preparation for the battle against Tiger. She also tells her that Tiger is short on manpower, but still has to face the invading Muosilian army of 40,000 men. Lisa then offers a complete withdrawal of her army from Legnica and a one-year non-aggression pact if Elen backs off now. Elen agrees with the added condition that Lisa must apologize to Sasha for the invasion. Once they reach an agreement, Elen immediately mobilizes her troops toward Leitmeritz. On the other hand, an envoy returns with a message from Mila to Barbaros, calling him an invader with no rights to be found on Brunian soil without a just cause. Mila says that they have no business picking up a fight with him, so he should return to his country. Barbaros agrees that she is right, but he won't back down from a battle simply because some pretty war maiden said so. With this, he gets his troops on the move, spreading out his men into seven discrete units so they can react quickly to surprise attacks while moving. With this being done, Barbaros waits to see what surprises Tiger has in store for him. The battle between Tiger and Barbaros is already brewing. Tiger's army gets into their formation as snow starts falling over them, marking the beginning of the Battle of Ormia. Some Muazinalian scouts bring reports about Tiger's army and their current positions, saying that they have fortified every inch of the hill and there are about four different banners, meaning that four different armies coalesce to form a single one. Also, attacks from the Muazinalian army are being met with stones and arrows from Tiger's army, although there are no casualties because the archers seem to be doing a terrible job aiming at their targets. Again, because the scouts spotted only a few spears, they assume that they're dealing with a really small army. According to plan, Tiger's silver meteor stormtroops establish a small stronghold atop one of the two short hills of Ormia, making it a makeshift fortress. However, because one of the hills is completely covered in snow, the Muazinalians believe that there is no enemy to be concerned about. Barbaros stations four of his seven divisions at the base of the hill to lay a siege to the mountain. The remaining 5th, 6th, and 7th divisions pursue the fleeing refugee group past the two hills to capture them as hostages. However, that was a decoy, and they are met with a surprise attack by the remaining stormtroopers and Mila's army coming from the seemingly unoccupied, snow-covered second hill. Barbaro's archers fire arrows at the opposing army, but Mila used her magic to create a barrier and turns the arrows into ice shards, shattering them completely. This gives Tiger an opening, enabling him to fire multiple arrows and take some of the enemy soldiers down. When Barbaros hears about the surprise attack from the snow-covered mountain, he seems not to be shaken, because it comes as no surprise him that Mila would have such an ironclad defense after all the rumors he had heard. However, Mila is not done delivering surprises to them, as it turns out that the group of fleeing refugees were actually disguised soldiers led by Rurik, about 2,000 of them. They deliver a surprising attack to the unsuspecting Muosilinan soldiers in the 5th Division, together with Tiger's main force. The Muosilinan soldiers hurriedly report this to their commander. The actual refugees were kept hidden in the hilltop fortress. 
For this excellent plan to work, Tiger had to beg on his knees for the refugees to comply, because they were already complaining about eating rotten foods and being forced to live in unfavorable circumstances. The leader of the civilian group speaks up and agrees to work with Tiger, because if the enemies were to lay a hold on them, they would kill them in no time, but under Tiger's plan, they had a chance to remain in safety and pull a quick one on the Muazalinan soldiers. Now that the 5th Division has been surrounded by Tiger's forces from all sides, they are easily wiped out, so Tiger and Mila proceeded to attack the 6th and 7th Divisions. Hearing this, Barbaros orders the 4th Division to come in as reinforcements, while the other three divisions keep up the siege at the hill base. The commander still seems to be unfazed, and plans to wear out Tiger's forces, leaving them vulnerable when he is ready to face both Tiger and Mila. This plan seems to have worked because as Tiger and Mila try to follow the 7th Division to corner Barbaros, they are unfortunately surrounded by the 6th and 4th Divisions and gradually, the flying column of the Silver Meteor Stormtroops begin to slack from exhaustion, leaving them vulnerable to attacks from the enemy's 6th Division. Now that the flying column has been defeated, the 6th Division closes in on Tiger and Mila's main force, while matters worsen for them when Barbaros sends his 6th and 7th Division to surround them on the sides. Barbaros backs up to his army so that no arrow can attack him, and with so much confidence in his arrow-proof formation, he excitedly anticipates a direct battle with Mila. The battle gets tougher by the minutes for both Tiger and Mila. They both show signs of exhaustion, and he begins to run out of arrows. Tiger tells Mila to escape quickly, given their current situation, but Mila declines and reminds him that she is a war maiden, not some weakling he picked from the streets. She says that, despite the fact that the enemy's army is larger than theirs, it shouldn't stop them from doing their best to win the war. With that, they are both encouraged and proceed to fight with everything they've got. Another army is seen approaching strongly, and just when things seem to be going south for Tiger, the new wave of troops flood in from the north to attack the Muazinalian army. Apparently, after hearing Masha's appeal, some knights came with their armies as reinforcements for Tiger. Emil brings with him 1 in 500 knights of the Order of Perche, Shea brings another 1,500 of the Order of Ludus, and August brings 2,000 of the Order of Calvados. While Emil and Shea join the battle, August tells Tiger that he received a letter from Roland and Olivier, asking him to join forces with him. He apologizes because his position as a royal knight kept him from helping Tiger earlier, even though he was a former soldier under Alsace's army. The arrival of the knights give Tiger and Mila some time to catch their breath, restock on arrows, and continue fighting. Even after hearing that there are 5,000 reinforcements supporting Tiger's army, Barbaros boastfully refuses to take heed and withdraw, so he sends his 4th division to back the others up, in an attempt to further weaken Tiger's main army. However, an additional 3,000 knights arrives from the northwest, and with the total reinforcement numbering 8,000 strong, Barbaros decides to retreat his army and send some of his remaining troops to the southern part of Brune to accomplish his main goal in conquering that region. At this point, about 30% of his men have been killed. But even worse news comes to Barbaros, he is told that his soldiers on sea were killed when their Nardier sank their ships. Now, they are soundly defeated by Duke their Nardier's army as well, leaving Barbaros with an army of 30,000 compared to his earlier 8,000. These losses cause Barbaros to withdraw completely from Brune and send an envoy to Silver Meteor Stormtroops base camp to congratulate them on their victory as an attempt to butter Tiger up. He also gives him an honorable name, Silvrash, which means one who is able to shoot meteors. After all formalities, Mila and Tiger try to discuss Barbaro's true motives, but he dozes off to sleep in the middle of it. The next morning, Elen arrives at the base camp to see them both sleeping next to each other, but their closeness infuriates Elen and leads to yet another argument between her and Mila over Tiger. On the other hand, Lim apologizes to Masha's for her absence during the war, and admits that despite her initial lack of faith in Tiger's abilities, he has proven her wrong, and become the third major force in the land of Brune. Mila also invites Tiger to her tent for some tea, but Tiger offers to meet Mila another time for tea, and goes to a secluded place outside to talk to Elen about the battle. He apologizes for losing so many of her soldiers for his battles. She holds his hand as they lay down on the grass to reassure him of his cause, and Tiger vows never to forget all those who died for him. After beating Muazinal and traveling for four days Tiger and his army camp at Perche, thanks to his new alliance with Emil of the Order of Perche. 
While he is sleeping, one of the war maidens, Valentina, appears through a magical portal created by her dragon gear. She stands by his bedside like a total creep and does absolutely nothing, and says they will meet again soon enough. She disappears the same way she came in. Elen and Mila begin their morning with their usual petty fights, Mila says Elen should have stayed back in ZCH Ted, but she was probably too worried about her men, and joined them at Perchel. Elen calls her a homesick baby and tells her not to worry about her because her soldiers are strong unlike hers. Because Elen was late and didn't make it to the battle with the Muazelinans, Mila mocks her. But Elen surprisingly admits that she was late and thanks Mila for standing by Tiger in her absence. Elen, however, says that Mila's job is done so she should return to ZCH Ted and leave her man alone. Later, Tiger is called for a meeting with Masha's and Lim concerning the late Prince of Brun. Apparently, there's someone with a striking familiarity to the prince in that camp. While they wonder who this might be, Bertrand interrupts the meeting, saying that a young girl named Regin is requesting an audience with Tiger. With the others around, she's initially hesitant to speak, but he reassures her that there is nothing for her to be scared of. In the council room, she reveals that she was previously known as Prince Regnes, the heir to the Brune Empire's throne. She gives her full name to be Regnaz Estelle War Bastion de Charles, a name so long that Masha's slumps immediately. Her revelation comes as a shock to everyone in the room so Lim tells her to prove her claim. She reminds Tiger of an experience they had while they were kids, a few years back, when they bumped into each other on the streets of Vincennes and ventured into the woods after hunting. Tiger verifies the story to be true, shocking everyone, as everyone believed that the prince was killed in battle. She confessed that on the first battle of Dinant, an assassin used the confusion caused by the night raid to attack her, so she relied on the attempt to fake her death and escape. Elen asks why she was pretending to be a boy in the first place, so Regin explains that she did it to save her mother's honor from the shame of not producing a male heir, because in Brune, if a queen cannot produce a male child, she is worthless. Also, Regina had to pretend to be a boy in order to increase the likelihood of succeeding her father to the throne, as the chances are very low for female children. Hearing her story, Elen and Mila argue that helping her would be disadvantageous to them, because if people find out that the prince is actually a girl, they would lose their confidence in Tiger. He suggests talking with the king, but Masha's reminds him of their king's unstable mental condition. When Tiger asks her why she trusts him enough to reveal her secret to him, Regin tells him that she has found him to be a man with no ulterior motives, despite being falsely accused of treachery. To the surprise of everyone, Regin reveals that she actually tested Tiger by asking him to bathe her, and because he was disciplined enough and treated her with respect, he gained her trust. Hearing this, Tiger agrees to help her if she can prove her bloodline. She says that there is a secret door to a shrine in Artesium, Duke Ganelin's territory, that only members of the royal family know how to open, and because the Prime Minister, Baduin, knows this, it will serve as the perfect proof of her genealogy. Convinced, Tiger decides to go to Artesium, but before they start their journey, Duke Thernardier's sorcerer provides him with five new dragons in preparation for battle, amongst which are a two-headed dragon and a fire breather. Two of these dragons have been bound in chains with special powers that enable them to easily destroy opponents, even as powerful as the War Maidens. Meanwhile, Gainlian anticipates everyone's plans as he soliloquizes, he knows about their nadir's dragons, and the fact that Tiger will try to prove Regin's lineage. He praises himself for doing a good job, as the poison has been working on the king. For his surprise plan, he decides to burn down his own capital before fleeing. Their nadir's dragons succeed in wiping out Gainlian's entire army, and he is informed that Regin is with Tiger. Accurately, he predicts that they're headed to the cave shrine, and boasts that he will behead the prince on sight. Meanwhile, the king of Zichet summons Sophie and appoints her as an emissary to the capital of Brune sends her again as an envoy to Brune's capital, and instructs her to tell Elen that she should prepare to withdraw from the six-month-long battle, when she is required to. On her way out, Sophie meets with a war maiden called Valentina, who seems to be acting sketchy. Regin is disappointed to find that Gainlian set Artesium on fire, but Tiger assures her that there will be no change in plans. On their way, they face off their nadir's army on the Villacresnes plains. Tiger's army of 20,000 clashes with their nadir's of 24,000, and while the two central columns are locked in battle, Elen and Mila push forward together on the right flank. Their aim is to break through their nadir's left flank and gain access to the dragons. 
Facing the dragons, both ladies summon their magic, and with Myla's barrage of ice, they're able to kill three of the dragons. However, they are unable to make a dent on the double-headed dragon and fire-breathing dragon due to their chains that are made of a special metal that counters the power of their weapons. While attacking, one of the dragon almost torches Mila because she freezes due to shock after seeing her attacks being repelled. Swiftly, Elen pushes her out of the way, but sustains some burn injuries from the flames. As their nadir watches the ladies from afar, he realizes just how powerful the war maidens are, and orders his soldiers to surround them tear them apart, even if it costs him a quarter of his soldiers. With no clear victors, the two armies retreat and re-strategize. Elen and Mila figure that the dragon's chains might have been responsible for their ability to repel their magical attacks, similarly to Roland's sword. Yet, the ladies believe it is possible to defeat the dragons, so they assure Tiger that they will handle the monsters, while he handles the Nardir's army. The battle resumes four hours later, and their nadir places the two dragons in the warfront, so Tiger commands his soldiers to flee if they don't want to serve as marshmallows for the dragons. This gives Elen and Mila the opportunity to deal with the dragons. Tiger's army was only pretending to flee because they needed more weapons, so after arming themselves sufficiently, they attack the left and right flanks, throwing whatever they has in their arsenal at the enemy, including stones. Gaining momentum, Tiger's soldiers have a confidence boost and begin to chant Silvrash as they chase after the enemies. Meanwhile, Elen and Mila ace the dragons in the center, and instead of using their weapon's powers against the dragons, they use them to get into contact with the dragons, allowing them to land direct injuries on the dragons. The fire-breathing dragon perishes pretty easily, but the two-headed dragon has a hard, impenetrable skin, flinging Elen to the ground the moment she attempts to land her sword on it. Elen and Mila launch a storm of ice shards over the dragon as a decoy, while Elen uses her wind powers to descend on the dragon's back with crazy acceleration enough to pierce through its skin and land a fatal blow. With the dragons defeated, the battle is as good as won, and they leave the rest to Tiger. After the battle, the ladies come to pick Tiger up, but find him sound asleep on the floor, exhausted from the battle. Elen suggests to do that kinky thing he likes and wake him with a sword in his mouth, but Titter refuses, worried that he'll be unable to chew anything after that. However, she remembers that he once said he would wake up in a split second if he ever senses an animal approaching. The crazy lady then gets on top of him and uses a technique called bloodlust to sound like an animal. Immediately, Tiger gets up and almost punches her thinking it's an animal, but he realizes that it was just Elen, so he apologizes. Later, Tiger and his party sit down to a delicious feast, with Titta serving them all sorts of meals. He tells them that they still have to head out to Artesium, although they won't be getting into the city itself. He plans to get underneath Artesium from outside the walls in order to validate Rijin's lineage. They realize that if they can prove her royal bloodline, they can use it to make the Brune civilians favor their cause and expose Duke Thernardier's and Gainlian's misdeeds against the kingdom. Regin then shares what her father told her about the shrine. The shrine, known as Holy Grotto, is where the founder of Brun received the divine knowledge needed to create Brun, and has three entrances. One in the central district of Artesium, another, lying southeast in the temple of the goddess, Masia, and the last is located northeast, at the public cemetery. The one in the temple of Masia is closest to them. Tiger says he will be going with Rajin to the temple, but his old attendant, Bertrand, begs to accompany them to the temple because he's getting old and knows this could be one of the last times he serves Tiger before he dies. Tiger allows him to tag along, on the condition that he disappears when the situation becomes dangerous. Seeing this, Elen offers to go, completely ignoring Lim and Myla's warnings to act like a war maiden and maintain her dignity, and commands Lim to assemble a team of five other strong people that'll serve as escorts. Tiger welcomes her on board, with the condition that she protects herself at all costs, and the princess afterwards. The next morning, Tiger, Rajin, Ilan, and a few guards arrive at the temple, which is really a small building barely holding itself up. Inside, Rajin opens the heavy door with the help of the guards, and they enter the underground tunnel with a staircase that leads to the grotto. Tiger says the tunnel feels chilly and could have been an escape tunnel, and Rajin shares it used to be a stronghold for families that ruled the area. On their way, they come across some dragon illustrations on the wall, and in ancient times, dragons were considered to be the only creatures that could harm a god. Elen disagrees with the legend, because the founder of ZHC Ted was supposedly the incarnation of a dragon. 
According to Rajin, the gods sometimes negotiated with the dragons and didn't always fight them, and their legend says that the three pillar goddesses were created to serve the dragons. Story time was over, and Rajin says that coming across the illustrations only meant that they were getting closer to the grotto. However, when they reach the holy place, they see Duke their Nardier already waiting for them. Their Nadir calls Rajin by her actual name, and proceeds to confess that he knows her secret and wishes her dead. He then draws his sword, aiming to kill her. Immediately, Bertrand drags her and runs towards safety, while the guards rush at each other on the opposite side. Their Nadir orders his second-in-command, Stade, to go after the princess, then Elen tells Rurik to handle the guys down, then she propels herself to the higher ground, where their Nadir stands and begins to battle with him. They swing their swords at each other until their nadir throws her to the ground with his heavier, double-headed sword. Rurik and Tiger try their best to hold off the guards below until the dramatic arrival of a heavily armored stade. Rurik rushes at him, but fails to land any significant blow with his sword, and even when Tiger fires an arrow at Stade's head from afar, he blocks it with his armored hand. Stade commends Tiger's exceptional archery skills as he was able to aim at his head even in a poorly lit environment, with so many guards in the way. Stade tells the other guards to move out of the way, because he is only there to kill Tiger and Princess Rajin. Above, their Nadir and Elen are roughing it out, and he is surprised at her exceptional fighting skills for someone her age. However, Elen returns the compliment with an insult, saying that he should be ashamed for picking a fight with girls her age. Their fight seems to be going nowhere, but suddenly, the cavern starts collapsing over them. Their nadir orders his men to fall back, but Stade approaches them without batting an eyelid, so Tiger tells Rurik to look after Bertrand and Rajin, then he runs with them. Due to the trembling cave, Tiger is unable to aim at Stade, who closes in quickly on him and aggressively swings his sword at him until Tiger falls. Elen turns back to rescue him, but some boulders block the way. He would have received a fatal blow if it weren't for Bertrand, who sacrifices himself to save Tiger. Stade gets crushed under falling boulders and Tiger loses consciousness. When he wakes up, he is surprised to see Stade dead, and in his kind nature, covers his eyes. Immediately, he searches for Bertrand and finds him gravely injured, losing so much blood. The old man confirms that Tiger is unhurt, and is glad to find that he did not sacrifice his life in vain. He thanks him for being such a brave and competent leader. As he recalls the good times they had while Tiger's father was alive, he confesses that he wasn't confident that Tiger could govern Alsace at a very young age, but now the young man has exceeded his expectations. Bertrand says he is glad to leave Alsace behind in his hands and tells him to look after Tida. With Tiger holding his hand, the old man finally succumbs to his injuries and dies. Meanwhile, Elen leads the others towards the Holy Grotto to rescue Tiger, but from afar, they see a giant bullet-like explosion and run towards it. Getting there, they find Tiger lying helplessly on the floor. She goes to pick him up and reprimands him for getting her all worked up over him, but when she gets to Bertrand, she finds him dead and asks for some ropes to get them out of there. Later, Elen and the others talk about Bertrand's numerous sacrifices for Tiger, whom he automatically became a father figure too. Bertrand's sacrifices stayed right from when he went across the border to look for him to now putting his life on the line for him. In a depressed state, Tiger recalls the events that happened at the cave. When he and Bertrand were trapped in the cave, Tiger fired an arrow with his bow's maximum power and the rocks above were completely blasted away, surprisingly. It was unbelievable, and at that moment, it became clear that he had now fully mastered the bow's powers. Unfortunately, seeing Bertrand's lifeless body took away from that victorious moment, and Tiger broke down in tears. Back at the camp, Tita watches helplessly as he mourns Bertrand, so Elen gets into his tent for a talk. She asks Tiger what his next plans are, but because of his current mood, he tells her to return the next day. Elen tells him that she won't allow him to make a hasty decision, so she lays out some options for him. She says he can quit the war and negotiate with their nadir based on some conditions, but Tiger is concerned about how she intends to achieve her own plans, but she reminds him that she's a war maiden and she intends to make every decision taking pride on who she is. Belen tells him that she used to be a mercenary who was homeless and was losing so many friends in battles, so she learned that the only thing she could lean on was her pride, which taught her to be true to herself. This speech encourages Tiger and he resolves to do the same, so he cheers up and moves to Tita, apologizing for keeping her worried and assures her that when it is all over, they'll return to Alsace and give Bertrand a befitting burial.
Tida immediately breaks down crying in his arms, and he comforts her. Later, Elen reveals her true intentions besides love for forming an alliance with Tiger. She enlightens him by making him realize that the Muazinalians wanted to conquer Brune South because it is a port city. With this knowledge, she wishes to connect Alsace with her kingdom, Leitmeritz, by a trading route through the Vosges Mountains. This is an alternative method to saving Alsace instead of going to war, and also an opportunity for Alsace to be enriched. Elen believes Tiger is a leader competent enough to drive this endeavor smoothly and maintain harmony between the two regions. The next day, the Prime Minister of Brune, Baduin, arrives to inform them that the king has recovered from his illness and that Duke Gainlian has been exposed for poisoning him. Baduin asks Tiger to reveal his true intentions for Brune after conquering their nadir, to which Tiger responds that he only wants to ensure that Alsace is safe before he returns to being a Zichechen prisoner. However, if Alsace can't be safe as a region in the Kingdom of Brune, Tiger will consider it becoming a part of ZHC Ted. Convinced by Tiger's words, Baduin permits them to hurry to the capital, nice to see the king, because the poison has done its damage, and he will likely not live for much longer. On their way to the capital, Duke Thernardier intercepts them with his army in the wildlands of Mirville. His army fights more clumsily than before because Stade is no longer there to lead them, and with Thernadier being nowhere in the picture, they are basically a lost sheep. While the battle is ongoing, Rajin shares her worries with Masha's about being next in line as the supreme commander, when there's a more competent leader such as Tiger. However, Masha's reassures her saying that the battle they're fighting is for her to walk safely into the capital, because only she is fit to rule over the city. After a while, Tiger locates their nadir and asks why he attacked Alsace. Their nadir explains his selfish reason, which basically stemmed from a personal beef he had against Zichet to prevent them from interfering in Brune's affairs. He says he ideally would have burned the land to ashes but failed to do so. Listening to their nadir's selfish reason, Tiger swears that he will never forgive him, and the Duke also says that he will never forgive him for slaying Zion. Angry, Tiger tries to kill their Nardier by using his bow's ultimate powers, but after seeing the rage in his eyes, Elen punches him back to his senses and urges him not to use hatred to accomplish his goals and to stop relying on the bow's magical powers. Realizing that she was telling the truth, Tiger calms down and calmly moves towards the Duke and takes only one arrow, throwing his other arrows to the ground. This is surprising to their Nadir, as he wonders just how Tiger intends to kill him in just one shot. Thernadia rushes towards Tiger with his sword, and at the same time, Tiger fires his shot, after calling for help from the goddess of wind and storms. The arrow pierces the duke right in the forehead, and kills him instantly, marking the defeat of Thernardier. The maidens are surprised that he didn't borrow magic from Elen's sword or his, meaning he achieved this feat purely based on skill, with the wind in his favor. After their victory, Tiger, Princess Regin, Elon, Mila, and the Silver Meteor Stormtroops are given a grand celebratory welcome from the locals. In the royal coach, he feels awkward sitting beside the princess and wearing clothes that aren't his usual rags. Tida is sitting opposite them, and she is, of course, jealous that she isn't the one seated beside him. When they meet the king, they also find Sophie there. The king apologizes to Regin for failing in his duties as her father and the king of their kingdom. He appreciates Tiger for making sacrifices for the kingdom and tells him to name his reward. Tiger requests for a piece of land Agnes, which was the port city that Muazinal wanted to capture. The king grants him this amongst others and signs the official documents to confirm his promise with Princess Regin as the consignatory, meaning she was now officially the rightful heir to the throne. Finally, the king honors Tiger with the title of Knight of the Moonlight, and this surprises Baduin because those with a title usually end up becoming King of Brune. Shortly after, the king dies a peaceful death. Later, like Elen hoped, she and Tiger start working together to unite Alsace and Leitmeritz by a trade route, 